It is a pleasure to be here with you today presenting this webinar. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and, and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. I'm just going to um, share my screen with you. So I won't be a sec while I, while I do that. The Small Farms Network Capital Region has been re rethinking how we deliver training events for small farmers in ways that allow you to keep learning farm skills when there are restrictions on gatherings and changing social interactions due to COVID-19. The webinar for format is allowing us to reach new audiences from all over New South Wales and other states. Today we have people joining us from Victoria, Western Australia and Queensland. Some of you will have met me at workshops, so it's nice to say hello from my home to yours. And to all our new participants, welcome and thanks for joining us here today. So just a little bit about the network. We are a community-based group led by farmers for farmers based just outside Canberra. Canberra. Our services include organising workshops and webinars, newsletters, organising group vaccination programs for livestock, such as our Get Ear Vaccination Clinic. We do Facebook and we have a website. Most of our workshops are hosted on small farms, giving you skills-based information where and when you need it most. We offer annual memberships for a range of services, including a member's email, advance notice of events and special member events. Membership is available online. Our committee is run by volunteers and what an amazing group they are. Their hard work makes this web web webinar possible. Thanks to Haji DeCinza and Jenny Curtis for their help in designing this webinar. The Small Farms Network received funding from the Every Bit Counts project. And thank you to the staff from New South Wales Local Land Services for their ongoing support. So I'm just going to um, tell you a little bit about how you can participate in the webinar tonight. Um, all the participants, you'll notice your um, microphone is, um, is, is muted. Um, and your video is also muted. Um, and you will see that there is a chat box that you can, um, you'll be able to type in your questions into the chat box. And um, towards the end of the webinar, I'll um, have collated some of those chats uh, or questions for Alistair and we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. We may not get to answer all your questions depending on how many there are, but we will do our best. We are recording this session and a recording link and webinar summary will be published on our website. The webinar summary will include references and links that Alistair, Alistair has discussed during the webinar. The webinar will run for approximately an hour. And if we have a lot of questions, it may go to five, for five to 10 minutes longer but we will be finished by 10 past eight at the latest. We hope you can stay with us and enjoy the webinar. It is my pleasure to introduce Alastair Rayner. While organising this webinar with Alastair, I've noticed his passion for small farmers and education. His depth of knowledge runs from practical on-farm advice to the apps and programs that can help save you money. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now and uh, just hand over, I'm going to um, just try and get rid of, uh, uh, not get rid of Haji, but uh, well, I will do that. But I'm going to hand over to you, Alistair, while I'll, while I'll sort out that little technical uh, uh, glitch. But thanks, Alistair. You, you go ahead and I'll, um, I'll sort Haji out. Thanks, Alex. And thank yeah. you um, very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, it is it is always really exciting to come and talk um, to anyone um, with a passion for livestock and 
I, I find there's a lot of satisfaction, a lot of excitement whenever I get to, um, to present with people. And um, while COVID's been a restriction for us, it's great that we can still get together in, at least in this format. So thank you for making time. I know at seven o'clock at night, it's probably right on ABC News time and toddler time and tea time and a few other things. And um, I have my, my three-year-old bouncing around outside somewhere. I can hear him as we speak. So I appreciate that you've all been able to make time to come along tonight. What we will do, I guess, given that, that we'd really like to try and move through a fair bit of things tonight, is I'm going to start um, with a little bit of a, a, a PowerPoint presentation to go through a number of different topics um, that are, are seasonally appropriate, particularly for people in the Canberra capital region. So my apologies to those of you who are joining from um, further away. Um, some of the links and the recommendations that I'll touch on as we go will apply to you. You will just need to uh, look for your own, um, your own state recommendations when I come to those. A little bit of just about me before we get uh, too far down the track. So I run a consultancy service based in New South Wales, which is known as Rainer Ag. Um, I specialise in grazing uh, management, uh, livestock selection, um, a lot of business enterprise evaluation and cash flow processes. So the last couple of months I've been uh, particularly tied up working with producers um, with MLA in the Back to Business program helping to do some recovery uh, from the bushfires that we experienced um, on the East Coast. And prior to that, a lot of my time was spent doing drought workshops across New South Wales and into Queensland. So a lot of the messages that I wanted to start with um, focused around nutrition are based very much on my experiences um, prior to joining or starting Rainer Ag. I was a beef cattle officer with the DPI. So 17 and a half years giving advice um, in that uh, format, and then seven years or so. And, and of those, a total uh, years delivering advice to producers, so just over, I think, 22 years or something along those lines, I think there was only one year where we didn't have a drought somewhere. Um, and so that experience makes me very comfortable in terms of trying to explain um, and, and get people to appreciate how to manage their nutritional programs more effectively. So when we're starting to think about nutrition, I guess that one of the things that, that really is the biggest challenge for a lot of people is that nutrition is one of those, those aspects that we can probably um, do a lot more effectively if we actually understand how animals and particularly how ruminants work. Um, remnants are amazing. It doesn't matter whether they're big cattle or little sheep or little cattle and big sheep, they all operate in the same way in that um, they uh, depend on their ability to um, consume and um, absorb nutrition from the feed that they eat based around how well the rumen functions within their body. And so understanding ruminants and rumination correctly will help you choose better feeds and help you manipulate your livestock's um, interaction with your pastures or with your supplements in the most efficient manner. So if we start to move our way down, I use this slide quite a lot because one of the, the things that I've experienced for a long time is that people tend to um, misrepresent or overestimate the importance of various um, components that livestock require. If you look at this, at this funnel, the most important part, the largest portion of it, and the one in the biggest words is energy. Energy drives everything in our animals. The ability of your animals to, um, to move around paddocks, to consume feed in itself, to go through reproductive processes, to just live, breathe and, and, and move is all driven by energy. When energy is um, greater than that, that basic level of, of, of need, it can then be used to allow your animals in a fertility sense to go into reproduction so they can start to go into estrus 
they will start to grow and put down muscle. And if there's surplus to those requirements, lactating um, females can produce more milk and anything over and above that will be stored as fatness. So once you've got energy um, sufficient to your animal's needs, you can start to then look to what your production requirements actually are. The second most important component in livestock requirements is protein. And we talk about it as crude protein. Now, protein is a really interesting um, component of any diet. And in a ruminant, because what you have and inside your, inside your animals is this rumen that provides to your livestock um, the capability to absorb the energy and the, the other nutrients that are actually held within pastures or the feed you provide. And these microflora, which are bacteria and fungi and, and um, populations that, that exist there, respond and, and generate and, and are activated by the level of nitrogen that is available in the feed that the animals are consuming. So nitrogen can be from all sources of feed. It can be the, crew, the, the true nitrogens that are within um, plant materials. It's with them, the amino acids and so on. All of those protein sources or those nitrogen sources stimulate and allow the rumen to function and to effectively and quickly break down feed that the animal has consumed to allow energy to be absorbed. If protein starts to be lacking, then you get a slowdown in rumen function. And so that slowdown impacts the level of energy that your animal can absorb and therefore slows down its ability to be productive. The next two um, and smaller letters and closer down the bottom where there's not as, as much emphasis on is vitamins and minerals. Vitamins are really important, but in most cases, livestock will consume more than enough from the feed that they're accessing in paddocks um, or that they're accessing from some supplements. The only time we really need to, to really kick in and add additional vitamins into a ration often tends to be when we've, we've been feeding um, uh, deficient type feeds, those that don't have a lot of vitamin contained in them, so a lot of grain-based feeds or dead pastures. And then we'd be thinking about vitamins A, D and E as a supplement. But they're certainly not the key limitation to animal performance. And that's why they come third on my, on my table here. And lastly, down the bottom is minerals. And minerals, again, are important for, for muscle function, for um, digestive ability, and for a range of other processes within the body. But again, minerals tend not to be the greatest limitation to animal production. And Nelly, every circumstance where I've been in, asked to come and look at, at how animals are performing and the producer says, I don't think they're getting enough minerals, in every case that I have had that um, happen to me, it has always been a deficiency of energy or protein. So there just has not been enough grass in front of those animals. So minerals um, tend to get a bit over, people get a bit excited about them um, and vitamins, but Generally, they're in sufficient quantities for most circumstances. If you are concerned and you've ruled out energy and protein and other issues, then we would start to look at vitamins and minerals as being a concern. And in some parts of New South Wales and um, Queensland, where I work, there are soils that are deficient in some minerals, and that then, then tends to, uh, to be a bit more important for us. But in most cases, in our grazing areas in New South Wales, um, energy and protein, big limitations to start with. The second part of that component, I think, tends to be the fact that most people um, often underestimate the amount of feed that they need to provide to livestock. And when we're providing livestock feed, we're talking about how much animals require on a per head basis per day. And we talk about that as dry matter. Um, because every feed that, that we provide, whether it's pasture feed, a forage, um, a grain supplement, or any other type of, of component, has some degree of moisture in it. And that moisture actually has no nutritional value. Water is important to animals for survival, but we don't provide it through feed, we provide it through access to clean drinking water elsewhere. 
So moisture within feeds can actually um, impact on the ability of animals to get their daily rations. And so when we start to compare and develop rations, if you rang up and asked me for advice, my advice would be to provide you with a ration that's based on a as fed amount. So that's allowing for that little bit of moisture that's within the feed you might provide. So it's important to consider that there is um, water in every feed that you'll use. And when we start to look at um, providing you with rations on a dry matter basis, um, published rations as, as I'm about to show you will be based on that as fed amount. But if you're doing your own calculations at home, one of the things that you might need to consider, and, and I'll use an example of a bale of hay, one of those little 25 kilo bales of hay. Within that bale of hay, you've weighed it and it's 25 kilos. But um, most hay is probably around about 80% dry matter, maybe 90%, depending on, I guess, the, the type of hay that it actually is. But if we assume that, um, the 25 um, kilo bales were baled at 80% dry matter, then we're actually looking at, um, at around about five, um, maybe just under five kilos of that total weight is, is actually moisture. So if you've developed a bit of a ration based on the fact that you're going to feed that, that hay bale to a group of sheep, have you taken into account the moisture component and are you actually providing the right amount or does your as fed amount actually have to be increased slightly to allow for that moisture component? The other part, I guess, to think about this is that the, the requirements of our livestock really do change quite a lot depending on their weight and depending on their stage of production. So this is, a, I, I guess, a fairly standard table that we use quite a lot that shows two things that are really important. The first thing is that the energy that your sheep requires increases as they go up in weight. So it's really important, first of all, that you look at the feed you're providing and think about, has it got sufficient energy per kilogram of dry matter for the weight of the sheep that I'm feeding? So a standard DSE that we often talk about is, is, a, is, a, is a 50 kilo sheep. Um, and they would require a minimum in their ration of seven megajoules of energy. You also need to have um, in a grazing environment that would go up to about 8.5 to allow for that extra extra energy required for movement around and for grazing. The other part of this but is the minimum amount of protein that needs to be in that feed to ensure that the rumen's functioning correctly. So to maintain a dry sheep at 50 kilos you need to have about six to eight percent crude protein to make sure that the rumen's actually functioning. And this is where it's important to start thinking about how much, um, uh, not just how much to feed, but also the quality of the feed that you're looking to provide. And then to recognize that as your sheep go up in, in production operations, so if they go from being a dry sheep to a mid-pregnant sheep, we would be looking at a significant increase in the amount of energy that that, that you requires to allow the, the, the lamb to grow inside her and to be able to support her own requirements as she um, carries that, you, that lamb through to lambing. Protein also needs to go up to make sure that there's enough function, but also enough rumen, being, uh, rumen bypass protein being sloshed out to allow for the development of the, the fetus and then of the lamb inside. You'll notice that then when we get to lactation, that fairly significant jump again up into energy and protein to ensure that you've got that um, capacity of your ewe to meet her requirements. And our young stock, our weaner sheep, they also need to have quite a high level of protein in their diet to allow for, uh, for bone and muscle development. So it really is important to think about not just the amount of feed that you'd be thinking about providing, but the quality of it. And not every feed is the same. So it is important to start asking a few questions about what type of feed you're providing and looking if you are purchasing feed to ask for the, the light, make sure you read the label and look at the energy and the protein contained in them. And ideally what we'd ask people to do is to, to request a commodity vendor deck, which is a declaration to keep in your records. And I'll come to those shortly um, to help you understand and be able to know 
what feed you're actually providing. I wanted to quickly touch on one other thing before I talk about calculating rations. We talk quite a lot about this thing called fiber. So neutral detergent fiber is the way that we measure the amount of fiber in a feed. And why it's important is one of, um, I guess, a, an easy way to actually work out how much your stock will willingly eat. And it's related to not just feed intake, but also it's tied into the availability of the energy that might be in that feed. So if you get a feed test back, or if you have a, a pasture that you might have sampled or a, a hay or a silage, if it comes back with fairly low levels of neutral detergent fiber, it often indicates higher energy, higher digestibility, and as a result, your animals are likely to eat more of that. So you get more intake, more energy, better performance. So the lower the NDF, the more the animal eats. However, you will get to a point where too low in fiber actually starts to impact on your sheep's performance or your cattle. And, and forgive me, this is a slide I've used for cattle producers, but it works in the same way. Once we get under, I guess, about 15% of NDF in a ration, so very lush young green pasture as an example, your animals are not actually getting enough fiber in their diet. And what starts to happen then is that they don't chew and they're not ruminating very much. And that rumination produces saliva, which is important in helping keep the pH of the rumen neutral. And a rumen that's in a neutral state has a much more active set of bugs in there doing their job of digesting feed. If they're not, and they start to get sick and they're not performing, you'll see that, the, that your animals will start to scour and they'll start to lose weight and they'll actually start to, to be effectively getting what we call acidosis because they're getting a rumen pH that's starting to become a bit more um, acidic. And so we find that having too low a level of fiber creates these issues around rumen upset. At the other end is when you have a very old, dry, mature pasture, it's very high um, in, in, in fiber, very low in digestibility. Your animals physically can't eat an awful lot of that. So not only can they not eat a lot of it, but what they do eat takes a long time to be digested. And when they do digest it, it tends to be pretty low in energy and protein. So you start to get, I guess, a double whammy of not being able to eat much. And what you do get is not that great. So ideally, when we're starting to think about how do we get our animals to perform really well, we want to try and have something that's got the minimum energy and the minimum protein, but also has around about 25 to about 40% fibre to ensure that our rumen is functioning correctly. So lush crops at the moment, for those of you that, that, that are experiencing um, some rapid growth um, as the seasonal changes, that's one of the things to think about. And very, very young, lush, leafy pasture, while it looks fantastic, it is high in energy, but often tends to have a little bit lower protein. So sometimes you get an imbalance in the energy and protein in that feed, and that can impact on that performance. Remember that, that protein has to be in balance with your energy. Or it could be that there's just not enough fiber in the ration. And sometimes you'll see producers adding in to, to their rations um, additional um, fibre in the form of hay or providing access to grass paddocks beside those, those crops to allow their animals to adjust their diet to reflect their, their fibre needs. And I guess as a bit of a, a wrap up on that, if you're thinking about how you might use it to check potential of a, of a feed as its value, we use a, a pretty simple um, equation, which is 120 divided by the NDF percentage on your feed test. And that'll come back with an intake percentage potential for you. So something like a, a barley grain has a very high level of, of intake or potential intake around about 6% if your animals could eat that. And that's 6% of their body weight um, on that dry matter basis. Oat straw at a very high level of fiber, the potential intake is quite low. So if you were thinking of a ration that was based only on oat and straw, the opportunity for your sheep to actually eat everything they need and get their, their total daily intake of energy and protein is probably not going to happen and will be really compromised by the fibre of that ration. 
So generally we work on, on a range of different um, intakes, but if we're um, expecting or we need our animals to be consuming between two and a half to 3% of their, of their body weight on a, on a dry matter basis, and they're eating one and a half to two, because of that poor pasture and poor quality feed, then you'll have live weight loss or lack of uh, milk production, or you'll actually see that they won't be cycling when you put them out with the rams. Now, I know that that's probably all a little bit um, challenging and, and, and people are sitting here going, well, how do we actually work it out? Um, and I guess that there's lots of different ways, but I like the easy way. Um, and the New South Wales DPI over a number of years has been developing calculations and we're now into, I guess, our third um, round of, of, of those ability to provide those calculations. And it's in this form of an app, which you can download for free from the iTunes store or the Android store and put it on your phone. And once it's on your phone, you don't need to be connected to the internet anymore. It actually operates a little bit like a, a calculator on your phone. So if you, you have no wireless connection or no network, don't panic, the app still works. And it does two things. It allows you to compare the best feed to purchase for your dollar based on whether you need to provide energy or not. It also lets you develop rations for specific groups and classes of stock. And you can save those in there along with any feeds that you might have used or any feed tests that you've done. So it's a, a handy ready reckoner for you to use actually out in paddocks. So when you download it, it will look like this um, on your screen, which just says drought and supplementary feed calculator. And it's a very simple tool to use and one that I think a lot of people might find quite handy. It helps you make decisions, first of all, about do you need to feed your stock in the first instance? And there are two questions that, that you have to work through. The first thing is to set the digestibility of your pasture. Now, again, if you haven't done a grazing course or progrose or something along those lines, you're probably going, oh gee, I don't know where I'm gonna start. Well, over here on this left-hand side is a, is a graph that really reflects and you choose whether you've got temperate or tropical pastures. And here's a growth curve. The growth curve on this side represents with the curve here, it represents the stage of growth of the pasture. So is it an active green lush growth? Is it late vegetative? So all green and leafy with no dead material in it? Has it got some flowers in it? Is it flowering with a little bit more green and dead? Is it now starting to be much more um, in head with a few late flowers and not many leaves? Or is it just dry grass and leaf? So it's what you see in front of you that gives you your guide of, of, of digestibilities. And all you need to do with the app now is just put your finger on where you think your pasture really looks at. So have a bit of a wander across. And if you think it's early flowering, mid flowering, put your finger somewhere there and it will choose for you the digestibility based on that. So that's your feed quality. And that will work out your energy and your protein based on that because we know in temperate pastures, the relationship between digestibility, energy and protein. The second thing that you need to set is how much pasture do you have? And again, um, Alex said that, you know, the worst thing about assessing is to, um, to have to put it in the microwave and cut it and dry it and weigh it and so on. And you can certainly do that. But to make some assessments in the paddock, all you really need to go and do is to work across and work out what you think the average height is across the paddock in centimetres and slide the scale up and down. The pasture density, as an example, zero density, sparse leaves and plants through to 100%, which is a lush, more, lush lawn or no bare areas. So once you, you determine where you think it might be, the app will automatically calculate for you the feed on offer in kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And that's gonna be a really useful tool for you because straight away it will tell you what's there in the paddock. Once you then start to look at that, it will then ask you to put into to the app what sort of pasture you're grazing. Now, I know that not everybody is going to um, have paddocks that are more than 20 hectares. So the, the thing that I would probably say to you for the smaller farms is that if, it, if, if you are not 
in a feedlot situation or a confinement feeding situation, so you're basically grazing paddocks, then treat it as more than 20 hectares. Then it will come up and say that it's early flowering and that's the biomass that, that, that has been calculated based on your assessments. And what you'll see here for 300 kilo, for, for 300 late pregnant ewes, which was the example I was using with a producer yesterday actually, we get um, at 50 kilo live weight, their daily intake is 1.1, uh, 1, effectively 1.1 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. So it wasn't a bad pasture when we looked at it, but effectively those years were actually consuming just on 82% of their daily energy requirement. And in that situation, you would expect that we should be providing a supplement to ensure that we don't have long-term weight loss, particularly leading up to, to um, lambing down. So the app will tell you whether you need to consider a supplement or not. The other option is that you can start to compare um, how much you need to provide to those sheep um, each day. And by choosing a supplement that might be in your silos or in your shed, it will come back and suggest. So we had oats on hand and it came back to suggest that the daily amount that we need to provide per year was uh, 0.27 of a kilo. The daily amount that we'd be feeding to those sheep was 81 uh, kilograms at a cost of 13 cents per head per day. And for a month, it was $4 per head. So it's a very good budgeting tool for you as well, particularly if you um, are looking to try and ensure that your small farm is maintaining itself or not exceeding um, costs unnecessarily. You can also use a little bit to do some budgeting with. And again, you might ask that, do you have pastures available? Um, and entering your pasture details. This is a different example, but again, um, more than 20 hectares in 65% digestibility, but a lower level of pasture feed. And this was for a cattle example. The daily intake was at 8.23 kilos and their daily energy requirement was well, um, um, was, was being um, not sustained by that pasture. So then we can start to ask different questions. So you can compare the feed that you might have on, on hand. This, um, I've split this screen into two, but effectively when you look at your app, it continues just down the screen. If we looked at pasture, hay or dried distiller's grain, that's a fairly common um, supplement a lot of people use. We could compare and see, well, if we fed pasture hay, given that it's a lower energy, uh, lower protein um, feed compared to distiller's grain, there's a fairly big differential in how much you need to provide um, to those animals per head per day. It's a fairly big cost difference. And so you'll see that the cost per head per day, this is a cattle example again, but it was costing with, with pasture hay something like $3 per head per day, but for distiller's grain it was $2 a day. Doesn't sound like an awful lot, but if you're feeding an awful lot of stock over a couple of months, that dollar a day saving adds out to being a fairly um, big amount of, of savings for you in terms of, of, of a total budget. So if you look over on this right hand side, the total ration cost for the period um, was fairly significant. You can also make a mix if you wanted to of those or up to five different ingredients. I guess um, I often talk to people about making sure that you do proper budgets to feed based on, and I use the calculators uh, that I've just shown you to work those um, ration costs out per head per day. And I can do a little bit of a sensitivity table if cereal grain, if that was what we were feeding, increased, um, what those increases might mean for my per head cost and for my ration cost for a month. And I guess the other part of that then is that livestock are not in a, in a, a static state. A late pregnant ewe is going to be a lactating ewe with a lamb on her. And so her energy requirements go up and because she's doing lactation, she's also going to need to have a little bit of fiber, additional fiber to help produce milk. So that ration, which I've calculated in the app, then comes back to a daily cost or cost per ton of dry matter 
the daily amount that you need to feed, the as fed amount. So you need to provide that 1.3 kilos per head per day. So it's a simple way of doing, I guess, some fairly complicated assessments on pasture, livestock and additional supplements. A couple of things that I just wanted to, to touch on before I finish on feeds, and, and I know that for a lot of you who might purchase feeds from local produce stores or elsewhere, um, you will get a label that will come with it, which is, will tell you, I guess, the basic level of energy and protein in your feed. But it's never going to be, I guess, um, that precise, perhaps, or particularly if you're buying bales of hay or silage bales or something along those lines. We would really firmly encourage you to go to the local land services close to you or to the Department of Primary Industries and get a feed test and send that feed test off and you'll get back the energy, the protein and the fiber of that feed. And that will allow you, and you can save it into the app to make some much more accurate and effective decisions about whether it's suitable for the stock you have or not. We'd also encourage you to think about the fact that, and I'll talk a bit more about this shortly, but when you purchase feed, you need to keep it on record. And ideally you should start to get in the habit of asking for what we call a commodity vendor declaration. People call them a CVD. And that really is going to help describe where it's come from um, and any other issues that may be associated with that. So you need to continue to use that where you can. You keep those within your, your LPA records. Because as um, I say to every person I speak to, it doesn't matter whether you've got 10,000 sheep or 10 sheep, your sheep have the potential to be in the food chain. And so we all have a responsibility to ensure that we know what we fed, what we fed it to, how much we fed and when that period was. So I guess I might park the feed quality option there for a second and I'm gonna come um, back to that shortly, but I wanted to move on to some questions that, and some discussion about effective worm control that was, um, that was put to me when we were putting this together. Look, worms are a really major concern for us in all sheep production areas, but not every area has the same uh, need to approach worms um, given that we've got different rainfall patterns, different temperature patterns. And so sometimes our worm burdens will be a bit different depending on our location. For um, the capital region, we really consider that to be the non-seasonal rainfall area of New South Wales. And there's actually a drench plan in place already. And I'm not sure that everybody who has sheep is really aware of this and often people tend to go off on their own tangents. And so their drench programs and their worm control programs are probably not as accurate as they could be. So the New South Wales DPI drench plan is available with a link from Worm Boss, and I'll also have those links up shortly. We'll provide these slides to the network so you'll be able to see the links afterwards as well. But what I have pulled from drench plan, which is I think a really neat little template that you can look to use for any of the programs within the, the, the non-seasonal rainfall area. And so what you'll notice is that two things that really drive um, a drench plan and a really good drench plan um, sit around the idea of good grazing management to prepare low worm risk pastures. So they're pastures that are not likely to have been grazed um, by sheep that potentially have high worm burdens or by goats or by other species. And we would actually look to ensure that we're doing some effective worm testing. So I'm not sure that the, the network has done worm testing at the moment. New South Wales DPI often runs fecal egg count courses. And it's a really good way to start to get a better handle about what's going on within your program and what type of parasite burdens you actually have. You'll notice then that um, July is really where we're starting to say preparation needs to, to happen and that um, we'd be thinking about testing all classes of our sheep 
including those pre-lambing ewes. When we move down into spring, I think that what we're starting to look at is our, our risk around things like liver fluke, um, but we'd also be doing some worm testing. And then we'll start to then look at um, what we might try to do with our younger stock, our young sheep, and again, whether they've got that opportunity to go to low worm risk pastures. You'll notice that there's a couple of just points there that we've got. So when we talk about an effective broad spectrum drench, we're really talking about something that's got about a 95% efficacy. Um, in terms of grazing management, um, I really think that this is an over, um, uh, an underlooked role. A lot of people are mixing um, classes of stock and exposing, I guess, the, the animals that are at greatest risk to, to pastures that potentially have fairly high worm burdens because they haven't done the, the preparation when they could do, which was to allow pastures to have a spell, to get a bit of growth in there and to break that cycle, that, um, that worm cycle up a little bit so that we're not likely to be reinfesting the stock that are coming on there next. Um, and I think that there are times where we really need to think about testing rather than automatically going straight into doing second summer drenches or additional drenches. Drenching in itself is a pretty expensive process. The real risk is that we're starting to see that continued increase of, of um, resistance. And often that's been brought on by over drenching or drenching unnecessarily. So as we come out, I guess, out of that drought period of last year, the other thing is make sure you do a worm test before you, you kick off the drenching program. There's some um, really strong evidence that drench resisting resistance is developing much faster in droughts. And that's potentially because um, there's been, I guess, that unnecessary degree of, of, of drenching that people haven't needed to do, but have gone and done it anyway. So it's really worth going back and looking at your calendar and having a think about what are the options within each of those months that you need to do in terms of grazing management and worm testing before you leap into these drenching programs. And you'll notice that here's the drenching sitting, I guess, as the, the, the final step in the process rather than the first option. It's really important to consider your own situation and not be trying to compare uh, what uh, is happening in your area with your friends over on the, the slopes and plains or in areas further north of you. So your program um, can be really tailored in different ways. And there are two ways that I think that you should be thinking about doing it. First of all, the Worm Boss program is probably the, the most effective tool for individual worm management. And again, that can be varied on the size of your operation. Um, the New South Wales DPI Drench Plan, which is a hard copy, and I've shown you, I guess, some of the key uh, tips out of the drench plan. But when you go into something like Worm Boss, it used to be paper-based like this. Um, now you can actually have it and store it online. And I think that there might be a few of you who've used this a fair bit. And if you haven't, this is a really useful tool. So this is for the, the non-seasonal. It's just a screenshot of how this actually starts to work in terms of it's, it's a simple flow chart. So if you have um, some, if there are no signs of worm risk, then you can start to, to move down the flow chart and it will take you through the series of things that you need to be considered to an end point, which will tell you whether you need to drench or not. And again, I guess what it really highlights for me is that there are people who like to reach for the drench gun um, because they think that that's just what they need to do. It's not necessarily the right thing to do. So take the time to work through through the decision guide and then come to a conclusion and, and use those recommendations in that way. So I guess that, that again, we could spend, and often with DPI and with my, my, my clients now, I could spend a, a day and a half talking about worm control, but the, the distilled message comes back down to make decisions based on evidence and worm testing is going to be a key part of that. Um, and use these tools. Worm Boss is brilliant, it's free, it's online, easy to get to. 
I guess now the last couple of things that I just wanted to come back to, and I know that some of you have probably spent time talking or thinking about on-farm biosecurity plans. Um, if you haven't, and you've just spent the last nine weeks um, in lockdown because of COVID, I guess there's a, I guess a really practical example of the importance of thinking about biosecurity and um, what could happen when things go pear-shaped. I wanted to talk about it tonight because um, about two years ago, everybody was very um, uh, much focused on their, their biosecurity plans and then no one's talking about it anymore. One of the important things about your biosecurity plan is it needs to be reviewed and updated each year. No plan stays the same, things change, and it's important to make sure that, um, that what you're planning to do is actually still current. The idea with your biosecurity plans is, is really to try and manage um, and contain risks where they possibly are, and if they're a bit bigger than you can manage, to, to then at least have a plan to know how you will deal with them in the event of that happening. So a biosecurity plan in its, in its really simple terms is just about what you will do. And to give yourself, but also the people that you work with or visit you, um, that instance of how you will manage those risks on your farm, but also how you will prevent those issues impacting on the broader industry. Your plan needs to be specific to your operation and it should have your property details, your enterprise information and the inputs that go into your system. The livestock that you buy in, the feed that you purchase, the products that you use within your system. You should think about people, the vehicles and equipment that may come onto your farm. What production practices do you have? What pests and weeds and outgoing products do you need to think about? You also really should have a little bit of a record about what, what uh, training and um, uh, workshops you've been to and keep that in your records as well. So events like this are really important as part of your professional development as producers. Um, some people who are concerned, particularly in cattle, about their Yoni's disease management, but it's not a requirement within a biosecurity plan. When I um, talk to anyone about how you might do this, and for those of you who might have um, careers outside of agriculture and have probably been inflicted with WHS um, over and over and over again, you'll have seen slides like this. But I, I like it because we tend to, in agriculture, always try to think about the worst possible thing that could happen and, and, and present that as a reason why we should never do anything. And I think that, that that's, it's great for, for getting a reaction in the pub, but you know, in practical terms, we need to have strategies to manage things. So when you think about the risks that might occur on your farm, think about them in this matrix. How likely is it to happen? Is it highly likely or is it a remote possibility? And then what's the consequence of that happening? Now, if it's a highly likely event that's unlikely to cause major consequences, it's probably a medium or a low risk. And that means that you probably don't have to do an awful lot of change within your program to manage that or to live with it or to prevent it happening. But if it was a highly likely um, event to happen with extreme consequences that could result in from WHS at death level through to business closure or quarantine or whatever it might be, then you need to straight away have a look at your production practices, your management strategies and say, I need to change this to reduce that risk um, and that event from being very high and bring it down to high or to a medium risk. And so that might mean that you'll change a few things in terms of what you do, and that's really effective, and that's what a plan should help you do. I've sent to Alex a copy of a biosecurity plan template, um, which I'd like you all to have a look at um, when you get a chance and have a, a think about ticking off and ensuring that you complete the details for your farm, your inputs, the people and equipment involved, your production practices, your outgoing products and your training and documentation. 
The plan is a Word document and what it has is these columns in front of you which looks at your inputs for livestock and, and, and then water and feed, etc. It asks you a simple question. So if I just pick the first one, which are only stock that arrive on the property inspected for their health status. So if you buy stock um, from someone or you buy them as the sheep that you already have. Livestock should be traveling with the national vendor declaration, which includes as a way bill. If you are pulled over by the stock squad in New South Wales, um, it is not an excuse that you just have two sheep. You are expected to have a way bill to ensure that those sheep are, are supposed to be transported. So whether it's a way bill, a transported stock statement or an NVD, you need to have one. So are you asking for those and are you keeping those? Animal health declarations. If you buy sheep in ACT Victoria and take them into New South Wales, they will need to have a sheep health declaration. So they're the reference documents that you're supposed to be keeping. So then you decide whether you're doing it, yes, no, or not appropriate. And you can work your way down through these, these questions and think about your practices as you go. All of us really have an obligation in the meat chain to be part of, the, of, of a quality assurance program. So the red meat um, industry works on the LPA, which is the Livestock Production Assurance System. Um, and that effectively, by, by managing to stay within the LPA, manages to help prove your biosecurity plans. Your NLIS transfers, the National Livestock Identification System, the transfers are for traceability. So that, and, and I guess everyone's been hearing the term trace back lately as people try to work out who was on the Ruby Princess, who was there to greet people getting off the Ruby Princess, where did they go to, what did they do, um, and how do we account for them? It's a great way of, of showing what trace back is. NLIS allows us to do that much more quickly with our livestock. So we can trace where animals have come from, where they've been um, transported to, and where they've spread out from to allow us to ensure traceability. But our farm records and our animal treatments and feeds underpin what you're saying in terms of your, your on-farm LPA records and your plans. So where it fits in terms of your livestock production assurance, one of the important things about the LPA is it allows you to have a current NVD, which is a national vendor declaration. So this is going to be something that you'll need to provide when you're looking to sell sheep. Now you can provide it as a hard copy or we're now going to online NVDs. And you can look these up under integrity systems, or if you typed in national vendor declaration, it will take you to those in your search engine. There's a couple of really important things in terms of your LPA. This is a document that allows um, us to ensure that your sheep are being transported correctly. And you'll see um, down here, there's that you've got your movement, um, your movement need to answer in terms of ensuring that these livestock are what has been described. I can spend a, a couple of hours talking to you about how to fill out NVDs correctly. I guess what I really want to, to highlight is that you need to have these in terms of ensuring they're capable of being um, um, used as a, as a transport stock statement but also that's what you should be asking for when you're buying sheep so that you know the history of them in terms of the chemical um, um, details, if they've been treated with scabby mouth, whether they've actually had any other treatments uh, provided to them, whether they're within withholding periods. So these are important questions to, to know and to be able to answer. The National Sheep Health Declaration if you're moving sheep into New South Wales, you need to have one of these. And I would encourage everybody to be asking for these anyway. You can download them from the biosecurity website, farmbiosecurity.com.au. The declarations and statements are there. But what you'll see is this is a health statement. So, and you can attach it to your NVD, but it works through your biosecurity questions, your animal health questions, and any other treatment that's been associated with those sheep. So it's an, an important 
been sheep hide from Facebook or wherever else. It's not an excuse. And we need to make sure that we've got everything uh, correct so that we don't be the ones responsible for um, impacting on the broader industry as well as destroying our own business um, for a number of years while we recover from, from, from events that might be associated with disease or health issues. There are two changes that I just, I guess, wanted to wrap up on in the, the LPA program, which was that, that your biosecurity plan is now part of LPA. So you do need to make sure that you have it. For those of you that have got a pick, and I believe that in um, the ACT, as in New South Wales, if you've got uh, livestock, you have to have a, a pick. You are potentially then, um, if you're part of the LPA system, potentially able to be audited to ensure that you, keep, you are keeping your records. So you will need to make sure that you've got your animal welfare standards included and your biosecurity plan up to date. LPA learning is designed to be done online. So the seven modules that come with the LPA include your property risk assessment, your safe and responsible livestock treatments, your pasture, fo stock foods and fodder treatments, how you prepare to move your livestock off farm, the transactions and movements of your animals, including whether they're fit to load or not, biosecurity and, and animal welfare. And you can do all of these online. And once you've completed this, you'll be entitled to have the current version of the NVD, which allows you then to be able to use it either as the online option or the paper option when you go through. So again, if you go to Meat and Livestock Australia and look in LPA, this is where you will end up. Where I'm about to, I guess, start to, to wrap up is the animal welfare standards and guidelines because a lot of people have probably um, not been aware that um, we have these in existence. But the welfare system in Australia that we have at the moment, which is under immense scrutiny, is really to, to ensure that we provide an acceptable level of care and treatment to all our livestock. The standards that, that um, exist are enforceable legal obligations. So, in each state, there's basically what they call the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. It has slightly different names in different states. The Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act in New South Wales is what is used to enforce these legal obligations. So the standards um, around food and water, treatment, transport and so on are all enforceable. So it's important, again, when you think about this, because if you have livestock, whether it's one sheep or 100 sheep, you have... Um, an obligation under the law to ensure that you comply with the standards. The guidelines that come with them are optional and they're designed to give you, I guess, best practice to ensure that your animal welfare standards are, are, are much higher than, than just the base level. So as part of your LPA requirement, you need to have on-farm systems that are, are consistent with the, with the requirements of the, the standards and the guidelines. And as the representative or the owner of the stock, you need to make sure that you've got a current copy and that anyone who's working with your animals understands it and ensures that they comply with it. So I've sent um, this to, to um, Alex so that she can provide it to you. But the standards and guidelines are all available. Um, the sheep version is there as well as the transport for sheep. Um, if you have cattle or other stock, they're also there as well. But you need to read it and make sure that you actually understand it. Because as we progress further and further into um, um, better practices for agriculture, we will have greater and greater expectations on how we, we manage the welfare of our animals. And so as winter um, comes through, as we come out of the drought, you know, we really have to make sure that we've, we've stayed on top of ensuring animals have sufficient feed and water for their requirements and that we handle them and care for them correctly. Um, so that's, as I've just said, the, the responsibility is to make sure that we're consistently complying with those standards and guidelines. So I reckon I've done pretty good, Alex. It's now eight o'clock and I can give you a few minutes for, for, for questions. I appreciate that, that for many of you,
this is information overload in, in an hour. And we've done three very big topics, uh, which would probably all be mini field days of their own. Um, I'm really happy to answer a few questions now, but please feel free to contact me if you wanted to, to follow up anything as a, um, um, an option for those of you on Facebook, you can find Rainer Ag on Facebook and, and uh, shoot me questions there. You can send me an email or contact me through my website. Um, and you can also sign up for my newsletter and, um, and stay in touch that way. So if you do have questions, um, feel free to shoot them to me that way. But otherwise, I might stop sharing this now and, um, and throw it back to you um, for uh, any further questions. Oh, great. Thanks, Alistair. Can you see the webinar chat? I have just, I've just gone across to do that so that I can do that. And um, let's have a look at chat. So the first question is from Jenny. From Jenny, yeah. Do you tend to need any mineral supplements in late? Look, it's a little bit of a, that's a little bit of a um, piece of string question, Jenny, because again, it's going to depend on what ration you're feeding. So if they're um, something that um, um, might be a risk of calcium is one of the, calcium and sodium tend to be the big things that we worry about, particularly for sheep. Um, and sometimes um, grain-based diets particularly, but also um, some um, feeds that are lacking or lowering calcium can be a real concern. And so you need to be thinking about um, um, probably, I'd be talking to um, your local vet about any concerns you had going into to that. And I'd be getting a feed test as well. Um, and look, I'm happy to maybe talk to you offline a little bit about what ration you're looking to do. Calcium is probably the biggest concern, but for, for late pregnancy and early lactation. Uh, Saskia, um, your biosecurity plans can be retrospective, um, but I guess it's a little bit, look, if you've got pet sheep and, and you've only got two or three sheep and it's a small backyard type block, um, then I probably wouldn't need to do that if they're not going to go into the food chain. Um, and no one's ever going to know about you because you're in the food chain. I guess what you need to think about is, are you about to start maybe acquiring a few more sheep and then selling a couple of extras? Um, then you're going to have to think about, well, this might be where I need to start to, to be part of the system. But if you're totally on your own as a, as a tiny little operation with two or three in the backyard, um, you should be okay. Steph, how long is ideal to rest a paddock to make it low worm risk? Um, again, that's a little bit of a, a piece of, of string question. Um, the, the life cycles of, of different worm species tend to be um, a little bit variable. So we would probably, you know, look, I'd be thinking um, as a minimum, I'd like to try and give four to six weeks. But again, um, I'd be, you know, again, probably guide a little bit about where you live, what pasture types you have, um, the rainfall and the season as well, because that also impacts on, I guess, the survivability. But you'd really want to have, I guess, a sufficient break. I don't know that two to three weeks is enough. Probably four is, is probably the minimum. And I'd be going maybe six weeks as, as a bit of a guide. And again, the DPI's um, drench guide has got a couple of different scenarios for that seasonal rainfall environment. And I think Worm Boss does for the other rainfall environments across the country. Cool, Saskia, that's good. Um, yeah, if you buy more sheep and you start selling them, you need to get involved. So we just had a few um, that people asked when they registered, um, Alistair, that maybe we'll just touch on very briefly. Um, uh, the question was about more about the health of the sheep and its poo and what causes diarrhea in sheep. And that was from um, Saskia as well. Um, but there was also a question about small pellets or big, bigger lumps or, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, look, diarrhea or scars can be caused by a number of different things, Saskia. So if you're really concerned, you probably should be, depending where you are, you can get, you, I'd be talking to, if you're in New South Wales, um, talking to the local land service district vet. 
um, because it, it may not necessarily be nutrition related. It could be, but may not necessarily be. In terms of, of little poos, big poos, often um, high fibre diets will result because it just can't be digested. And um, pellets, where sheep tend to be very good at, at chewing up because they've got those sort of really fine teeth, they get down and they're really selective, much more than cattle are. And you'll see that they'll select fairly high digestible pastures as much as possible. So their pellets are always going to be the little shotgun shells that we always used to see. So I guess if you notice significant changes, maybe the question comes back, what are these guys eating to cause that to happen? Scows, um, I tend to think, you know, I'd be wanting to talk probably more to a health professional in the first instance about it. Okay. And I'll, I'll make this the, the last one. We, we do have a couple of interesting ones on, on pasture management. Um, so, but is there a, what is the best improved pasture for sheep? Um, I think we discussed this when we were setting up the webinar, but um, you had some interesting ideas about that, Alistair. I just wondered if you could share that with the audience. I have lots of interesting ideas. I'm trying to remember what they were, but I think, look, at the end of the day, um, an improved pasture species is one that's going to have, I guess, um, good legume base in it. So you need to have legumes. You need to have a clover um, or um, some other legumes in there because it improves digestibility, increases energy, um, does work for the soil. So there's, there's a bottle need to have a legume in there. But, you know, I'd like to try and have a pasture that was deep rooted and, and grows well and actually ensures that I've got sufficient quality and quantity. So one of the problems with our unimproved or our native species is that, that, that they're designed to respond to rainfall events, they grow really quickly. So if you grow really quickly, you go from being green and leafy and highly vegetative and highly digestible and very valuable to being dead and stemmy with a seed head on it and low digestible and low value. So the idea with our improved species is to find those species for your environment that are going to give you that longer growing period where you're going to have more leaf, um, better digestibility, and so then ensure that you've got better opportunities for production. So the best pasture is really, I guess, going to be what are the, the improved species for your area that will grow well? Um, how do you manage? And then the next question is going to be how do you manage them? Because you know, management is really how do you ensure that you've got sufficient quantity um, for the, the class of stock that you have, so to avoid overgrazing. And then there's that other point, at what point is it too um, high and too rank for sheep to actually graze? So we know that, you know, sheep prefer to have pastures that tend to be um, somewhere in the order of about 800 to, you know, 2,400 kilograms of dry matter which is, you know, something about this high and reasonably dense. Once it gets that big and, and over, you know, your sheep are, are going to struggle a bit more to actually consume it. And the other thing is that once your pastures start to get here, they think that, that, that they're on their way to growing seeds. And so they'll continue to get more mature, the fibre will increase, the digestibility, the energy and so on will start to decrease down. So in terms of your pasture management, you, know, you really need to have some budgets about how you get your growth rates and your intakes balanced up pretty right. That's probably our next then our next session. That's a whole progress course in that one. Yeah, yeah, there is a, definitely is a, a a big course in that. And and so I mean, it's interesting to to have mentioned progress, um, and we have run that for small farmers before. But um, I think the key message probably is is to look out for it, regardless of. Um, you know, there's the LLS run them and if people can jump onto that course, it's definitely going to give you some really great information. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Alistair. I think that's been really, really wonderful. And I don't know about other people, but the hours just flown, flown, flown by. So um, thanks very much for that. Um, you'll stay there for a moment. I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to screen share my screen now. So um, we've got you there, Alistair. Yep. Thank you. You're looking younger and less hairy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, 
I really just haven't got too much more to say, but other just other than just to close off the webinar. So, but um, just to let the audience know that um, on our website, we do actually have about four um, workshop summaries that we've run before on sheep and also worm management and also biosecurity. So um, when I've run a workshop, um, I've actually put up um, some information about all of those topics that we've touched on today. Um, we didn't talk much about um, vaccinations, but um, there'll be some information on the website about vaccinations and sheep as well. On the website, you can sign up for our free, free newsletter where you'll, and um, you'll get notice of our upcoming events early. Um, and you can also like, like us on Facebook. If you have chickens, you may be interested in our next webinar on backyard chicken keeping with Dr. Lou Baskin from Southeast Local Land Services this Saturday morning at 9.30 a.m. And tickets are available on our website or on Facebook. I'm also organising a few more webinars later this month on small scale chicken and egg production and acid soils filling the bare patches. So um, yeah, jump on and, and sign up for our newsletter so you know when they're coming up. So I don't think there's much more to say, Alistair, other than, other than to say um, thank you very much um, for, for um, joining us. And um, yeah, um, hopefully we'll see you again online sometime. Look forward to it. And we'll come and see you sometime down in Canberra. Okay, great. Thanks, Alistair. Yeah, Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us.